Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Are things really getting weirder, or are people just watching too many cable news shows? Why is the paranormal, especially UFOs, finding its way into the headlines so much recently? Are there any nasty surprises in store for us over the next few years, a la 2012? Hello there, and welcome to the 261st edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Ben, and asking those questions was my, well, I'm not so sure I want to hear the answers to those questions, was my (laughs) co-host and partner in the paranormal, my dad. But it's Mondays with Murray tonight, as we welcome back one of our most famous and popular guests. But first, we have to survive our weekly paranormal contest. So last week's question had two parts, where and when was the Effingham carcass found? Well, Mary McGuire of Boston, what nationality is suppose she is? Mary McGuire of Boston was the winner, and the answer was Vancouver Island, Canada in 1947. A lot of things happened in 47, didn't they, Ben? Oh, yes. The Effingham carcass was a section of a 40-foot-long creature found on the shore near Effingham on Vancouver Island. As with most sea serpent remains, quote-unquote, the experts, quote-unquote, also pronounced that it was the body of a decomposed basking shark. As far as I know, the largest of these sharks ever recorded was 45 feet, so I suppose that identification is entirely possible. Yeah, they, they tend to stomp all over everyone's fun. So this yeah. week's question is, in what year uh, and in what U.S. state did the Maelstrom Air Force Base UFO incident take place? Okay, well... So get that right and win a copy of Behind Moss Curtain and Other Great Savannah Stories by tonight's guest. Well, our guest today is one of our dearest friends and one of your favorites. Murray Silver is a fifth-generation son of Savannah, Georgia. He is not only a Washington insider and Hollywood insider, he is one of America's most respected paranormal investigators. A host of the PBS television series Haunted South, Murray is the acclaimed author of the book Great Balls of Fire, the uncensored story of Jerry Lee Lewis, which was made into the movie of that name starring Dennis Quaid and Winona Ryder. He is the author of a number of other books, including his memoirs, When Elvis Meets the Dalai Lama. He used to work for the Dalai Lama, believe it or not. And Behind the Moss Curtain, which Ben just mentioned. Murray worked in the late 1960s as the promoter or a promoter for rock bands like Fleetwood Mac, Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, and others. While going to law school, he transitioned from promoter to journalist in the 1970s and 80s, touring with acts such as Pink Floyd, Paul McCartney, Bob Dylan, Elton John, and Peter Gabriel. On top of all that, Murray is also a publisher and a television producer with his own media company. He became a paranormal investigator and historian of great insight and depth. His website is www.bonaventurebooks.com. It's Bonaventure with two T's, bonaventurebooks.com. Murray Silver, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. Gentlemen, it's always nice to hear your voices. How are things with you? Pretty fair. Thank you very much. And it's even better now that you're with us, Murray. Uh, I just want to mention, we uh, we do welcome callers on the show. Sometimes we get so involved with our conversations, we forget to give you the number. But it is 401-766-1240 locally and nationally, 800-449-1240. Now, a lot of you love Murray, and this is your chance to talk to him. So, take it away, Ben. All right, Murray. So, things have been pretty weird right now. I mean, we all can admit that everything's been very, very weird the last year or so. So what do you see happening over the next few years? Yeah, and just take it away. Politically, paranormally, or both, or the same thing, or what? Go ahead. Well, you know, since the last time we talked, my ongoing theme has been uh, upheaval, uh, pursuant to this, this tremendous shift that we are going through, have been going through for the past two years, will continue to go through for the next two years. It, it was alluded to by the Mayan. But what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the end of one great epoch of time and the beginning of another, and those things never happen uh, peacefully. And so um, since we've talked last, there have been um, more horrific things that have happened in the news on the physical plane, the spiritual plane, the emotional and mental plane, and there's not going to be any uh, any shortage of that in the days ahead. And... Uh, as far as as far as the planet is concerned, let's start at the top and work down. As far as the planet is concerned, the next thing that is going to happen, the next shift, because now remember now the physical plane works on, on many different levels, but the next thing that we're going to see and you'll be able to to track is 
actually going to be a problem with uh, coronal mass ejection. Um, if you know anything about magnetism on this planet and the sudden explosion of magnetized plasma from the sun's corona, um, this is something that was not detected up until about 40 years ago. And it's because uh, coronal ejection can send so many charged particles at high speeds to Earth that they penetrate the magnetosphere and it, it, it protect that, which is what protects the Earth from the solar wind. But um, these geomagnetic storms are the things that disrupt communications and navigation systems and satellites and power grids. And this is going to be the next thing that's going to happen on this planet. We've seen earthquakes and we've seen tidal waves and so forth and so on. But the next major thing you're going to see as far as nature is concerned is going to emanate from the sun. Now, you got to remember now, the Mayans were very attuned to astrology, and they were very big into the sun, and this was one of the things that played into their prediction that 2012 was going to be a very difficult year for more reasons than, than one. But then right. even starting at the top, the bigger issue that's going to affect the entire planet is going to be these coronal mass ejections, which are going to... Well, there, there, will, there will probably come a day when you will wake up and nothing is going to work because the, the magnetic... Uh, field will be disrupted by these ejections. And you know, so um, that's that's my next major concern for the planet. On, on the one hand, Murray, you know, uh, uh, we've and Ben and I have talked about this before. We have uh, I have a, an astronomer, or several astronomers recently who have been I've been in communication with, and who a friend of ours has uh, been in communication with, an author who writes about the 2012 situation, uh, Dearlon, who's going to be a guest next week, as a matter of fact, and we have heard from many different circles what you just said. They're not making it public, but the coronal mass ejection of the solar phenomenon that sends these, these wild electromagnetic pulses, these EMPs, out into the solar system can do just that. On the other hand, and you know, you can tell me what you think about this, I can't believe that utility companies and governments, or maybe not governments because they're not very organized, but utility companies are going to allow themselves to lose money by not taking some sort of steps to prevent, or at least at least mitigate some of the damage from this. I mean, well, how do you say, know they already haven't? I mean, they could have, and you just we just don't know it. Maybe, maybe. What, do, what say you, Murray? Well, I don't know what is being done preemptively. You can't put a very big umbrella over the planet. But the point of this is that this is what Spirit has revealed to me, and Spirit has revealed this to me um, in a number of different ways. Some of these some of these visions that come across to me uh, are truly. Uh, phenomenal in, in, in that I have not had this kind of experience before, but I get these very detailed visions that I did not get in time to pass, and this is what I'm seeing, this is what, what Spirit is showing me. A lot of people are telling the same story, Well, in a the, way, including us. Yeah. Well, here's the interesting thing, though. Um, I can only attest to that which I have personally experienced, and there's something going on in Savannah, Georgia right now, gentlemen that I find even more remarkable than what has happened uh, heretofore. Um, there are, we are having right now, in the midst of this horrible recession, depression, whatever you want to call it, we are having a banner year in tourism in Savannah, and tourism is going to top the best year we ever had by two or three million people. And, and people are, I mean, it's right now, it's the heat factor in Savannah, has got to be 117 degrees. That's not an exaggeration. And yet tonight, tonight there will be 45 different tour companies roaming the streets of Savannah with up to 30 people in each group, and they're looking for ghosts. Now, follow me now. Follow me now. The interesting thing about this is that this has not only continued unabated, but it's growing exponentially. We've got people coming to this town Regardless of, of their financial ability, regardless of what's going on in this world, debt stealing crisis and the rest of it, we the town is literally crawling with people that are looking for spirit. And yet, and yet, and yet, the typical person is not here just looking for a cheap thrill. No, what this involves now is a matter of integrity. And by integrity, I mean the fact that many of these people have come to the point where they understand their place in the world and the life they have lived, and that acceptance is allowing them to serve as elders to others and to give back to the community. And so they're experiencing this midlife crisis, 
which is a shift from the materialistic to spiritual, and they're asking the bigger questions, why are we here, and what is our purpose? And it is spirit that is what's turning them on, and they've come to Savannah to get in better touch with it, and there have been a couple of events that have happened to me personally in the past couple of months since I last talked to you that are more astounding than any other case I have studied or heard of, and if I was a better writer, I'd write a book about it, but in spite of all the things I have written, I don't know that I could do justice to this story, because it is truly phenomenal in every sense of the word. Well, you're an outstanding writer, and you're also an outstanding speaker. Here you go. Tell us about what happened, if you can. Well, gentlemen, this will be this will be uh, right up your alley. Now, pardon me if this takes a couple of minutes to download you, but I promise you it's That's worth, okay. the, it's worth the, uh, the story. I was doing a book signing um, a couple of months ago, and um, a, a two women approached me. They were from New Jersey. They were visiting Savannah for the very first time. These were women in their 40s, both married, both had children. Uh, their husbands own their own businesses. These women had come to, to Savannah because they'd heard a lot about it, always wanted to visit here. They come to Savannah. They're walking around. They see me doing this, this signing, and they approach me to ask me simply one question, and that is, um, from an insider's point of view, what would you suggest that we do in order to enjoy the town? And I said, well, what, what are you here for? And they said, well, we're here. We're all about spirit. I said, well, if it was me, and I had one afternoon to spend in Savannah, Georgia, and I was in search of spirit. I would send you to Bonaventure Cemetery, where Savannah has buried her dead since the 1850s. And I said, it is a Victorian cemetery. It is a beautiful place. It's built on what had been a colonial plantation. It overlooks a beautiful bluff. I said, and if you got to go, this is a good place to spend eternity. And so uh, the women took my advice. They went to Bonaventure, and about two days later, they came back to find me, and they told me that they needed to tell me something very important, and they did not want to do it in a public place, and so we met later for dinner, and the two women told me that they had gone to Bonaventure Cemetery in the afternoon, broad daylight, 3 o'clock, and they were walking around the cemetery when they were approached by a man, and the man conducted them on a tour of the cemetery and delivered them to the grave site of two women who lived in Savannah about a hundred years ago. And as the two women looked at these grave sites, they were overcome by this in a rather remarkable feeling. And the feeling that they got was that they were looking at their own graves. And as they stood there dealing with this flood of feeling that's overcoming them, uh, the man told them that, in fact, uh, this is who they had been in former lifetimes. And at that point, the women wanted to know more about this man who described himself as a minister. And the man said, but um, I, I have a favor to ask of you. I need your help. And the women said, well, what is it that you want from us? And the man said, well, my, my daughter was murdered by her husband, and he then committed suicide. And his spirit is preventing hers from crossing over. He has her trapped. She needs to cross. He, cannot, he will not allow it, and, and I need your help in helping my daughter cross over. And the women turned to him and said, well, that's... We, we don't know how to... How are we supposed to do that, sir? And he said, well, you go back and talk to a man that you just met two days ago, the writer. Go back and ask him, and he will help you. And before these women could ask him any more questions, Paul and Ben, the man disappeared. And by disappeared, I don't mean he ducked behind a tree or got in his car and drove off. He simply dematerialized in front of them. And the women came back to tell me that they had encountered this, had gone through this, and they were confident that they hadn't lost their minds because these two women had experienced this together, and they appeared to be very sane and rational women to me, and they said to me, they said, listen, you've got to believe us. We swear that this is true. And so the women 
after telling me this story, they said uh, that this this preacher, this minister, said that we're supposed to come back and talk to you. He needs help with the, the spirit of his daughter. So in any event, they gave me the names of this minister, and they gave me his daughter's name. And uh, these two women then the next day went home to New Jersey, and believe me, they were anxious to go. And I began to do my research into the lives of these people and into the lives of the two women buried in the plot that these women had encountered and thought they had discovered their past lives. And it turned out that um, there was a case a hundred years ago in Savannah, rather well known, of a prominent lawyer who murdered his wife, committed suicide, they're buried side by side at Bonaventure Cemetery, and that the name that the minister gave these two women was the name of the man who was the father of the woman involved in this murder-suicide. So I did my research and found out that everything these women told me was true. And after finding this out, I reported back to them. I said, well, this is truly, this is truly remarkable. This is utterly remarkable to me. I said, now, ladies, you know, I, I've heard a lot of great stories in my lifetime. So far, this may be the best one yet. Are you aware that those women contacted us? Well, I, I told them that I wanted them to contact you because I thought that, first of all, Paul, i got to tell you something. I began to have my doubts about these women. I didn't know if they were having me on or if they were, I didn't know exactly what their agenda was. But the point, that's, that's the reason why I told him, first of all, I wanted to talk to you about a couple of issues, which we'll take up in a minute, but I wanted to finish relating what happened next. Sure. Wait, wait, wait. When, when, did, you, when did this happen to you? Why didn't you tell me about this? Well, I'm sorry. Well, well, I know, well you handle some of the emails. We get so many. We, we get thousands of emails, and I handle some. You handle you don't the even, other. You don't even tell me anything interesting. Well, I'm sorry. You know, um, you, uh, it, it, all right. It's fine. I don't, I don't really care. I just, <laughs> okay. wanted, I just wanted to bust your chops. Put, put Dad on the spot here. Uh, <laughs> It was uh, yeah, a couple months back. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Murray. Don't well, mind what him. happened next was that that uh, Diane, who this woman is a, a wife, mother, uh, school teacher, and Diane is one of these women coming to Savannah who says that their psychic abilities are becoming stronger and stronger these days. That they don't understand it because yep. heretofore they had none. And Diane then, uh, as I reported back to her what I discovered, Diane said to me, she said, Murray. I continue to get these visitations from spirit, and and this minister is pleading with me that you've got to go and do something. You've got to go and do something right now because you're running out of time. This woman's been dead a very long time, and the window of opportunity is closing, and the spirit is insisting that you set her free. And so I said, well, listen... Uh, I happen to know some prescribed methods for helping spirit move on. And I said, um, you know, I, the problem for me is getting access to the house where the murder took place. If she's still earthbound, probably she's there. And they said, no, no, we've been told by spirit you're not to go in there because it would be extremely dangerous for you. And I said, well, how am I supposed to do this if I don't, if I don't go to the place where it should be done? He said, no, no. Spirit's telling us that you should go to the cemetery where husband and wife are buried and conduct the ritual there. Now, Paul, Ben, I told these ladies, I said, all right, listen, listen. I'm going to do what you've asked me to do. I have certain reservations, but I'm going to honor your request because I believe that it is sincere. And I'm going to That's go and do this That's what we got from them was fear. They seemed very afraid. Well, I told him, I said, you know, I'm going to honor this request. I said, but there's something you're going to do for me. When, I've, when I'm done with this, I'm going to send you. You got to remember, they're back in New Jersey. I'm down there in Savannah. I said, I'm going to send you a list of questions that I'm going to want spirit to answer. Because I'm going to want validation that what I have done has indeed uh, been effectual and, and has achieved the the, the purpose. And so, gentlemen, I went to Bonaventure Cemetery and I took with me two assistants. 
I took I took an impartial observer with a camera. I took a woman of great psychic ability, and the three of us went to Bonaventure Cemetery. We went to the grave site involved, and there were certain things that I did. And when this was completed, I came home and I typed out to Diane ten questions about what I had done, and I sent them to her. And the next day, she sent me back the answers, and nine out of ten were 100% correct, and the tenth one was only off a forgivable margin, proving that, in fact, spirit had seen and heard what had happened. It had had the desired effect. It had set this woman free, and spirit wanted us all to know that. And so at that point, I was convinced that these women were for real, that what they had experienced was for real, and because there was no one else in the cemetery, the other the two people I was with did not know these women in New Jersey, so there's no way they could have gotten this information. And yet, the, the, the rituals, Paul, that I performed were not that of the Catholic Church. And consequently, I was doing things that... Um, most people have never even heard about the the rituals that I performed are not common. You don't hear, but you don't see these on TV or in movies. It's not you know, it's not uh, eagle feathers and so forth and so on and, and and strange incantations. No, this is some of these these practices have been done for thousands of years. But the point is, that I was convinced that these women were in fact in touch with spirit as they had claimed. But that. That's not the end of the story. The P.S. to the story is that Diane, the woman living in New Jersey, the teacher, has lived a life that is parallel and mirror image to the woman whose grave she found at Bonaventure Cemetery. In fact, there's a direct connection in that the woman who lived here 100 years ago was a school teacher, started her own school for disadvantaged and special needs children. And after several years, things did not work out for her in Savannah, so she packed up and moved to New Jersey, and that is where she died and then came back was buried in Savannah. Now, a hundred years later, this woman in New Jersey has for the past ten years operated, owned and operated a school for special needs children, and she has taken up where her former incarnation left off, and after having found this woman in Savannah, is now in the process of moving back here with her husband and daughter to try to unite past and present. And if that's not the damnedest story you've ever heard, I'll, I'll lose my bet. It's got to be one of them. Well, we're going to take a commercial break. we got a lot of questions for Murray after we come back. You're listening to Behind the Paranormal on... Well, with Paul and Ben Eno, we're not leaving you out here, but hmm. behind the with Paul and Ben Eno on WON, 1240 AM and com in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley. We'll be right back with Murray Silver. Saludos amigos. Well, you asked for me and now you've got me. Now you can hear me, Vic Ramos, and my friends on my bilingual show Saturday mornings from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. in addition to my Friday night show. Can you believe it? It's like Saturday morning cartoons all over again. Wake up and tune in. Owen Radio. Owen Worldwide. Okay, we wanted to remind you of our wonderful sponsor, Amazon Kindle. And Amazon Kindle, of course, for those of you who may or may not know, is an ebook reader. And the publishing world, I can testify from bitter experiences going from print to digital very often. And uh, ebook is a, a book that is something you can download to your Kindle reader and simply read it. You can subscribe to magazines, newspapers, this sort of thing. And it's um, really a very, very uh, marvelous way to spend your summers on the beach or wherever you may be. And it's as, as cheap as $114. You can get them at Staples, a number of other places, or online, Amazon.com. You can also get four of my humble books uh, on on uh, that venue as well, including my uh, 
History of Rhode Island, uh, which I wrote with Glenn Laxton, Rhode Island, a genial history, which is probably of no interest to this audience. Oh, then again, no, we have a local audience, so maybe they're interested. And also, um, uh, Marie's books, I, I dare say, might be uh, on Kindle as well. Uh, Marie, are you still, are you with us? You know, um, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm not a techie. Neither am I, but, the, <laughs> but they're, have, they're paying yet, the bills, so. We haven't yet done that e-book thing, although we are looking into it, but to be perfectly honest with you, I had no idea that so much would change so fast on this planet. And I never thought I'd be... I never thought that books would go the way of phonograph records, but there you are. Well, they're coming back, too. But let me finish the commercial first, and we can continue that. But anyway, uh, certainly Amazon Kindle, Amazon.com, and check it out at Staples as well. So we're back behind the paranormal with uh, Paul and Ben Eno and Murray Silver. Now, Ben's got a question. All right. So, Murray, one quick question. Are you still in contact with the Dalai Lama? Well, actually, I've seen them uh, in, in the last couple of weeks. I, w- I ran up to Washington real quick to take a peek at what was going on there when he was doing the Kala Chakra initiation. And, in fact, today, even as we speak, his monks were here in Savannah. They've been here the past week. They did a mandala um, privately for some friends of mine. And um, so, yeah, I, I do stay in regular contact with His Holiness. Oh, uh, what, what, is, what are his opinions of what's happening in the next couple of years? If you be willing to share them, at least. Uh, well, on on what level? Uh, well, well, any level. you know, we're, we're, let me just we're tying everything together here. I think with uh, starting out with electromagnetic pulses and coronal flares and things like this, getting into uh, what we would term the thinning of the multiversal boundaries, the boundaries between worlds. More paranormal stuff is happening. Uh, the women we were talking about and we'll continue to talk about as we go uh, are experiencing just that. The thinning of the boundaries. People who had no abilities, uh, psychic or whatever you want to call them before this, are having them now just as you said. It all ties together. And I think uh, maybe what Ben's getting at, I don't want to speak for him, but I'll get in trouble. It, it's but, okay. Just, just Yeah, just, well, you know, what... Uh, <laughs> What is the Dalai Lama? He, he's he's tuned into this. I know he is. I mean, what uh, what does he? How does he tie it all together? What does he think is coming? What's well, the know, result the of all this? Thing, when you're talking to him, you know the phenomenal thing about him is that he's really way out there. And by that I mean, um, he we once had a conversation about uh, aliens and the possibility of aliens. You and the Dalai Lama. Uh, yeah, and yeah. We, we were talking about what the possibility of aliens were and so forth and so on. He said, well. He said that there are there are many other worlds just like this one, and he said chances are you've lived on them in past lives, and he is of the opinion that it is quite possible for spirit to live in these different planets and and to to live different lives on different planets. But he said this is how real how great breakthroughs um, come about in civilization. For example, you know there's, there's got to be a way that man. If you look at the evolution of man in the last 10,000 years and the quantum leaps that he has made, um, there have been such quantum leaps that um, it's very hard to explain it just in normal terms of evolution. And so consequently, His Holiness believes that it is quite possible that there have been this constant influx of alien spirit or, or spirit that has had alien lives come into this world. You know, for example, the Einstein. Um, come into this world, the, the Michelangelos, the Leonardos, uh, they come into this world and they, they move mankind forward. And so that's why His Holiness says, if this world comes to an end, no fears, no worries, there's plenty more out there just like this one. So he has, he has a rather unique take on the end of the world in 2012. He laughs at the suggestion. He says it doesn't matter. If, if this world comes to an end, believe me, there's plenty of others out there that you can take residence in. And I don't think I've ever seen or heard that um, explained anywhere else, not even in science fiction, but that's His Holiness' story, and he's sticking to it. Well, you might have heard it explained by Ben and me on Coast to Coast on May 16th. We got 3,000 emails because of it. And George Nury was horrified that we weren't upset about it. He said, and we said essentially, he said plenty more worlds there. Well, more, more. He was more upset with me than he was you. Yeah, because you're like older than I am, obviously. Because I'm 19, you're 58. Well, he knows you better than he knows me. Well, yeah, and he was like, "How are you not afraid of this?" And <laughs> you have George so much is a to, sweetheart, you but have so you know. Much to live anyway, for. well, let, let, let's get back on track here. One of the, I mean, I, I think that's incredible and 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 very true and i think a lot of people are on the same wavelength because this but i want to get back to the cemetery here so to speak and finish our conversation about that murray 
Can you tell us exactly what rituals you performed and what tradition they were from, or, or would you prefer not to say? Well, yeah, you know, I don't mind sharing with you, Paul, but um, I'm going to tell you exactly what I did, um, and I'm going to tell you the reason why I did it. Uh, my job was to set uh, earthbound spirit free, and so consequently what I did is I used a couple of things that I knew to be personally effective, but also um, things that are universally so. Um, so what I did was, uh, one of the questions I asked Spirit was, all right, what prayers did I recite? And the answer that came back to Diane was that the language that I spoke was um, rather unusual, ancient. It was not Latin, and it wasn't Hebrew. And, in fact, it was Sanskrit. Hmm. And so I said some Sanskrit prayers that I had learned from, from Tibetan Buddhist monks who are experts in these matters of, of uh, spirit and, um, it, it, and, and helping spirit move on. And so I was reciting, first of all, prayers that I'd gotten from them. The other thing that I took with me, and spirit had seen that I had sprinkled earth elements on the grave, one being um, sand and the other being water, but they said this holy water was different from Catholic holy water. And what I had with me was water and dust from the Yamuna River in India, which for 10,000 years has been used for rituals to break the bond of spirit on earth. I had this material because a dear friend of mine, uh, who is Hindu, I had consulted him because uh, about a year ago in Savannah, a Hindu man was murdered in a robbery. He owned a little convenience store. He was murdered and he was haunting the shop where he died, and I wanted to help him, and I wanted to help him in his sacred tradition, so I contacted this pal of mine, and he said, listen, Murray, this is what you do. I'm going to send you the water from the Yamuna, dust, and, and a uh, Krishna prayer that you recite. He said, use this, and it will cleanse the area. It will set spirit free. So I took these materials with me. I took white sage that I had gotten from some Indians that I know, and I burned white sage. I sprinkled the dust and the water from the Yamuna. I said prayers both in Sanskrit and in Hindi. And um, I did the visualization, and I gave instructions clearly to the man that he had to release his wife and that he should also take the same trip with her and that they should... Uh, and I also want to quickly interject here that in the prior week, before doing this ceremony out at the cemetery, gentlemen, I had two deaths in my family, and they were buried a hundred yards away from where I'm doing this ritual. Oh, and I goodness. asked the spirit of my recently departed cousin to help me in this transition and to lead these people to the other side. So having invoked them and having done all of these things and so forth, this is basically the power that I invoked to move spirit because... When you're speaking to spirit, spirit speaks a universal language, but it also has the power to understand you no matter what language you are speaking. And so, therefore, hence the effect of Hindu prayers, Tibetan prayers. And so this actually is, is what I performed at the site. I, I smudged the entire area. I sprinkled uh, the water and the dust. I said the prayers. I gave the instructions. And that is how I, I effected this. Now, the remarkable thing was is that uh, I went home and typed out the questions for Diane to ask Spirit, and Spirit gave her all of the answers as if... And, and the Spirit of the Reverend said that he had been standing there, saw the whole thing, and could repeat to Diane verbatim exactly what I had done. And so consequently, I was confident that I had the, the validation that I needed... But one of the things that I wanted her to speak to you about, Paul, because of your experience uh, going through um, uh, the, the process of becoming a Catholic priest and dealing with exorcism, I wanted you to listen to what she had to say to get your impression of what she was dealing with, because from time to time, some of the visitations she gets are truly horrific. Yeah, she And told me I about wasn't sure if she was dealing with parasites, and I know that you've had a tremendous experience with this, and so I thought that you would be invaluable 
with helping her understand what it is that she is in contact with. So I wanted to get your impression uh, from her and, and the conversation that you had with her. Okay, well, she wrote it, and, and I, I, she mentioned you and uh, that she had been dealing with you, and I was not aware that you had suggested that she contact us, but I was you know, very pleased that she did. The story that she told was not unusual. Uh, I often hear stories such as this, and the request certainly for uh, prayers or some sort of spiritual help for someone who had passed uh, is very, very common naturally. But the and the re- even the reincarnation belief and the story that this perhaps w- had been a, her life in a previous existence was a common theme as well. However, I was struck by how upset she was and how uh, somewhat confused because she did not she wasn't used to this sort of thing. I mean, most people aren't. So I wrote back a very I try, tried to put in a, a gentle and comforting way. Uh, our point of view of what this is, and you know, we 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 generally think in Ben and I think in very different terms from the usual spiritualist approach. But in a way, I suppose we're saying, in a way, maybe in a, in a multi-dimensional way, what everybody thinks anyway about this. And what we were doing was to just suggest that she take the simple approach. We always suggest a simple approach, unless someone is as skilled as you are in the, these various traditions and that they simply maintain a, a spirit of compassion and uh, love and calmness and silence and sort of send out, if you want to say, waves or feelings of compassion or and love toward this person. That never hurts anyone, no matter what this is. And we find sometimes that if it is not what it claims to be, which is very common as well, and that it is a parasitical entity and not really somebody who is beneficial, then that love and compassion will often repel the evil, almost always will. And that's essentially what I told her. She was a little confused at first, but I I told her again that this is essentially what it was, keep it simple, and uh, as you say, this seems to have been accomplished, whether what I told her was relevant or not to that being accomplished, I don't know, but I like to think that... um, maybe at least in instructing her in how to be positive and compassionate in a simple way uh, in these situations was beneficial. So that, that's a, I really can't say any more than that. That's all I, that was the extent of my involvement with it. Well, she is in the process now of moving here this week, and the phenomenal thing is that she brings with her, she's closed her school in New Jersey. She's coming down here. She says that she's not sure exactly what she is supposed to do now as she, as she unites present with past. But the interesting thing was she said to me, she said, look, my husband needs a job. And I said, well, what does he want to do? She said, well, he, he wants to be a cook. I said, well, does he know how? She said, no. I said, well, he's moving to a town where we've got some famous ones. And I said, this is not a good town to come just to uh, try that out. But in any event, long story short was I made one phone call for this man and got him a job with a pal of mine who owns a restaurant and getting ready to expand. And now, keep in mind now, Diane's husband has no experience in the food business. But not only did my pal offer him a job, but offered to make him a partner. Oh, and the astounding, the astounding thing is, is that I had introduced several other people to this pal of mine, all of whom he rejected. And some of them had long and colorful track records in the food business. But yet he takes one look at Mark and says, you're the guy. And so I'm beginning to feel like these people are indeed supposed to be here. And I do believe that what's going to happen to them will be fascinating. But I want to quickly interject that Diane and Mark are not the only people I know like this. There are a number of people that I have met through the last couple of years that have moved to Savannah blind, and very quickly they find the job of their dreams, the home of their dreams, whatever's been missing in their lives up until now, they find it here, but it's only because they are now in touch with and in pursuit of spirit. And once they put spirit first, once they put that as the forefront, then spirit kicks in in a way in which I have never seen happen anywhere else or quite to this extent, but it's truly phenomenal to me that it continues, and it's getting stronger, which indicates to me that, that and, and to tie it all up, gentlemen, I think the reason we're seeing this proliferation of spirit is that spirit is keenly aware of what's going on on this planet on all of the different levels, and spirit is trying desperately to help us through it, desperately to help us through it. I, I, I think you're right, but I wanted to point out one thing about 
something. But Ben, did you have anything else before I do that? Uh, no, go nuts. Okay, I want to put it that way. Uh, this, well, however, that, that's a good lead into to the point. The, I've sometimes found with the reincarnation thing, and you know, we, we believe in parallel lives, not past lives. Time doesn't exist that way, but it's at six of one half dozen of the other. Right. I very often find that people, and I've seen this, can get morbidly wrapped up in the the other life. All right, that's and right. that's and I'm sure I, I'm, I'm not pointing out anything you don't know. This is for the benefit of the listeners. But people need to keep their feet on the ground and do what they're supposed to do and and do it with love in their hearts, and that's what really counts. Um, I would just warn people. Yeah, we, we all have these, these other lives. They're all over the place, everywhere, every when, in many forms. Uh, we're, we're a very big personality, each of us, and all together we're an even bigger one. Just be kind of where you are. You're here for a reason, and uh, you're in your current consciousness for a reason, and use it as best you, as you, can, as best you can. And, and uh, I just warn people against being morbidly involved with any other, any other life, in a sense, other than being aware of it and learning from it. That, well, that's Paul, all I have to say. You're, you're right on the money, and that is why I, I was very afraid for Diane. That's why I wanted to talk to you. And I told her, said, Diane, I said, before you take up this life that ended 100 years ago, I said, you better find out how it ended. <laughs> yeah. And you, be, you better find out what unresolved issues there are. I said, else you, you stand a better chance of repeating it rather than carrying on and going forward. So consequently, that was my initial concern for the woman is that, like you say, to develop this, this morbid interest that would simply cause her to repeat and not move forward. And so, um, but the thing is that it, that she says that the, the pull to come back to Savannah is inescapable, and she is compelled to return here to face whatever uncertain future she has. She just feels that once she is here, she's where she ought to be, and, and, and she's going to, to hopefully sort it out and, and make some progress in this lifetime. Yeah, I can respect that. I wanted to move on a little bit to um, UFOs. You know, we try and tie it all together on this show, as you know, with various phenomena really sometimes have the same sources and the same, and maybe the same purpose. How do you, th- there are just as many UFO sightings in the headlines now as there are people who are experiencing these things for the first time, whether it be the psychic abilities or whether it be visions or uh, you know one thinks of joel old men shall see visions young men shall dream dreams you know mm. and uh i i just wonder what, what are your thoughts on the, the ufo thing as part of this well it, it's always been it's always been a part it's not like this is a new phenomena mm-hmm. the thing to me though is that i'm often uh, prompted to give people the same advice regarding ufos as uh ghost as a seeing ghost i tell people that if you want to first of all if you want to see it and secondly if you want to understand better what you are seeing the first thing that you have to do is you have to lay aside everything you think you know about that's it. right everything you know is wrong you, you cannot bring these preconceived ideas and expect that you are going to be met with that and so i i further advise people that you have to suspend the reflex to impose your beliefs onto every situation you encounter, and you have to hold what you are seeing exactly as it is. Good advice. And if you do it right, you will experience things beyond your wildest imagination. But that that means that you have to hold these things exactly as they are, instead of and when you look at something, think, well, that's that's exactly what I think it is, and therefore it should act the way I expect it to. And so consequently, if you, you, you will then have the ability to change everything you see into a more uh, wonderful version of itself. But you have to encounter it on its terms and not yours. And that is often the, ra- the reason why people do not see ghosts, even if they're standing right in front of them. They don't know what they're looking at. So consequently, it's the same thing with UFOs. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking at, then you don't see it. See it in, in quotes. Do you think that perhaps the exopolitics movement, the idea that uh, our, our ideas of law and order and uh, respect and diplomacy can be extended to extraterrestrials, which is a big movement now within the UFO community, do you think that might be an example of what you just said? Well, yeah, if only because the mind is not a continuous and rigid thing. The mind is an arbitrary setting. And therefore, if you want to change your mind, all you have to do is change the setting. And by changing your setting, 
You can see ghosts at will. You can see UFOs at will. But but the point is that most people are so rigid in their thinking, Paul, they never get to that point. And that is what that is what I think we have embarked upon in this age and in this era. There are things happening to people. They're having the experience, and they're running around trying to find out what it means, which is far better than hearing about experiences and going out and trying to replicate them. And that's why a lot of people are coming to Savannah, because they're trying to find out what all of this means, the spirit influx that they're experiencing. They want to find out what this means because they're having the experiences. They just don't know what to make of them. Mm. And so what I try to help them do is I help them change these arbitrary settings so that they can experience these things more fully. All right. Now, Ben's got another question, but before he asks it, I want to give you a chance to talk about your books and where people can find out more about you, websites, et cetera, because before we run out of time. All right. I can't uh, hear you, Ben. Uh, oh, oh, no, no. No, I was, it's, no, no, I was going to say before, We're saying you should put, like, plug, it, plug your books. And yeah, website. just but before we run out of time, Ben has a question, but before he does, tell us about oh, your books, your website, well, and where people can find out more about you. Um, you can find me through Bonaventure Books. It's spelled, it's, I took the name from the cemetery. Um, there's a lot of good stories out there if you can dig them up. And well put. Uh, B-O-N-A-V-E-N-T-T-U-R-E is the website, Bonaventure Books. We've got a dozen different titles, but to tell you the truth, gentlemen, in recent times, I have shifted away from my work and trying to help other people come to print. They have important things to say. Um, consequently, Behind the Moss Curtain, which is my collection of true Savannah stories, is no longer in print. It is sold out. The last edition, the eighth edition, is sold out. And I thought that if it was to be another edition, that it needed to be freshened up and updated and edited, and that is the process I'm going through now. Um, at the same time, um, Brad Pitt is still sitting on the uh, the Great Balls of Fire project. He wants to reboot the Jerry Lee Lewis story, and he's he's going to make this film with the man that he just completed a, a film called Tree of Life, which is out now. Mm-hmm. Terrence Malick uh, directed this film. Uh, it's gotten a lot of rave reviews and won a lot of big re- awards in Cannes. Oh, yeah. But um, Terrence Malick, many years ago, was given the task of writing a script based on my book for the first movie. It was passed over, and so Terrence has now sold that script to Brad Pitt, and Brad and Terrence are going to finally get around to uh, making the Jerry Lee Lewis movie that I've been waiting on for 30 years. Great. So um, at, the, at the same time, though, I, I have postponed my plans to publish a book on ghosts, if only because I do not feel this is the thing that I want to uh, publish at this point in time, if only because the ghost is just such a small part of the big picture. And oh, yeah. many people are wrapped up in it to the point that they, they can't move beyond it, and that's not the purpose of ghost. and I don't want to contribute to this confusion. Having guested on Zach Bagans' show, Ghost Adventures, it was an extremely popular episode, judging by the response that I get from people. But the point is that this, this purient interest that people have in ghosts is not what spirit is trying to do here. And I'm trying to move beyond that and get to the matters that you discuss on your show every week. I'm trying to move beyond. Ghost is almost passe, gentlemen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ghost, ghost is, is simply, I mean, it has its place in this world, but it's just, a piece of the puzzle without which the puzzle is incomplete, but it's just a small piece. It's so not true. the big picture. Yeah. So I'm trying to move beyond that, and I don't think it would be fair of me now to put out a book about ghosts and and and, um, and not take people to where I think spirit is trying to lead us. Mm-hmm. Well, Ben, uh, that uh, talk of Hollywood leads right into Ben's uh, question. I was just going to make a quick comment because we were talking about exopolitics before. I've never actually said this on the show, but I think it's just completely ridiculous, the whole concept of exopolitics. I've always wanted to say this to the guests, but I, I never had the gumption to say it because they were really nice people, and I was like, well, they mean well. But it's just, I find it ridiculous that we have to have relations with all different creatures out there, even though they're not even... I don't know. The way I feel about it is 
why do we have to feel that there has to be creatures out there that are just like us when there aren't? Because it's just they're looking for life in all the wrong places. Hmm. Yeah, that's just that's just what well, I feel as Stephen about Hawking it. points out, uh, he thinks there might be serious dangers if there are aliens visiting us, and I happen to agree with him. I yeah, I, I, too, yeah, I agree with him on that, too. Yeah, so anyway... Um, so anyway, we have, well, about five minutes, but let's just quickly get to this question. Um, what do you think of paranormal theme movies uh, that have been coming out in Hollywood lately? Well, I, I want to be honest with you. I, I have not seen many of them. Nor have we. I, I, nope. and, and here's the thing. Now, gentlemen, follow me now. Uh, I cut off my television a long time. I don't watch television. These days, these are very, 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 very difficult times. I don't know about what's going on in your house, but I've got a lot of things that are going on in mine on different levels, and I have to cut down on the noise level. And the first thing that I tell people, you got to turn off the television set. It's crazy making stuff. The job of the TV is to make you watch it. And consequently, I tell people, you know, we're talking about arbitrary mind setting that you that you can change if you want to be in touch with these other things. Well, first of all, you've got to cut down the noise level in your life. Oh, so true. And you've got to get rid of the television set because it's poisonous. And consequently, I don't see movies. I, even though I'm in the movie business, I don't see movies. And the funny thing is, if there's only one thing that all truly successful people have in common. And it's the one question I've asked of every interview I've ever done, whether it's the Dalai Lama, Ted Turner, whoever, they will all tell you they do not watch television. We don't. Because television uh, well, I is a don't. Waste of time. You don't watch it really much either, do you? You, are, you watch the news and... Well, the news is one thing, but that's we're talking about television programming. So, I mean, the news is one thing, yep. and mm-hmm. even the Dalai Lama will watch the world news, but the bottom line I'm saying to you is television as a, as a consumer item, Right. Uh, much of the stuff. No, 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 no. You've got to turn this off. And so I, I don't see these movies. I've heard about some of them. But quite frankly, I, again, that plays to what I call the, the purient interest in spirit. Uh, and I understand why it exists. Everybody loves a good scare. They have for since the days of Frankenstein. But the bottom line is that's not what I'm about. I don't have time for it. Because... The kinds of things that have happened to Diane and her friend in Savannah, I find far more compelling. And I don't know that there's a book or movie out there that's better than the story that I told you earlier today. Well, the story's still developing. Marie, I'm afraid we're out of time. It's always a wonderful experience to talk with you. And we're going to continue with Mondays with Marie uh, as as often as we can. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. We love you. And um, we'll be in touch off the air. Thanks for being there, boys. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Marie Silver, everybody. Okay, well, let's uh, have to wrap it up here, I'm afraid. I want to tell you about the Exeter UFO Festival on Labor Day weekend, Exeter, New Hampshire. Uh, it was tremendous fun last year, Ben and I went, and this year we're among the speakers. We're going to be talking about uh, Beyond UFOs, Aliens, and the Paranormal. That should be interesting, a new program from Ben and Paul. And let's um, <clears throat> just uh, remind you, too, about Internet, I should say, intermetu.com, the International Metaphysical University, where I teach a humble course in science, religion, and the paranormal. And we want to thank our producer. Thank you. Uh, the much revered <laughs> uh, Craig, uh, Craig Pelletier is here as well from Texas. And uh, Steve Bianchi, who's uh, waving his fingers on our face here. And I um, wanted to say that uh, be with us next Monday, August 1st, when Ben and I will welcome back Steve Fermani of MUFON, one of the organizers of the Exeter Festival. And he's going to give us an update on UFOs over in New England and also a preview of the festival we just mentioned. Uh, Labor Day weekend, as we say, in Exeter, New Hampshire, the site of the great Betty and Barney Hill incident of 1960, uh, the first abduction incident that got any press in the United States. All right. In the meantime, tune into our live Sunday evening CBS radio edition in Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Seattle on www.newskyradio.com and ON, oh, not ON, AOL Radio. <laughs> Uh, on, too many May, on May 31st, um, my dad and I will welcome back uh, Lee Stewart Hadwin, the brilliant British artist, there's a lot of bees there, uh, who paints in his sleep, and he can't remember doing it. And remember, you can always get free podcasts on, and show schedules and shows and guest information at www.behindtheparanormal.com. And we'll leave you this evening with a thought from the 19th century American author Ralph Waldo Emerson, also a cousin of ours. Quote, Though we travel the world over to find the beautiful, 
we must carry it with us or we find it not. Thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey, and we'll see you next time. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.